so there's kind of a Hatfield McCoy situation going on down there on the river because the National Butterfly Center, the wall goes right up to the National Butterfly Center. And um, I don't know, have you heard about some of that back and forth? <laughs> when you know, it's kind of funny that, uh, that most of the times when I read something or I see something or they might be having some kind of demonstration or something. And um, it, it's, it's, it's kind of like who has an issue, bring it over. Because there'll be like Lupe and Antifa and the Black Panthers. And then they say we're, it's an economic deal, we're losing money. And when I look at it, the thing, I said, it's none of those things. This is not an emotional issue, whether people are coming here, they're poor people, they're starving, they're sick. It's not an emotional issue. It's a legal issue. They have no right to just invade our country. So I don't know why they, they, they fail to recognize that it's simple as a legal issue. Do people have the right to invade our country or to come to our country other than through the port of entry and ask permission come the legal way. So uh, to me, those arguments are all emotional arguments and they, they just don't register anywhere. They have nothing, it's a mood subject when they bring in emotions about all these things about caging kids and all that. That's all emotion, it's just a legal issue and it should be addressed legally. We're a sovereign country and we have rights to, you know, most people that complain about they don't like the wall, if you go to their houses, they have walls around their houses. Their properties are surrounded by walls or fences. So then how can they say our nation doesn't have the right to do what they're doing in their properties? So, um, you know, it's kind of it's interesting to me because when I see these mass migrations of people coming, uh, and then I hear the reporter saying about, you know, all these poor people and they're starving and they're coming here for asylum and, and I... I've, I've literally, you know, over all this period, I've ri literally seen thousands of them on, on the news in some part or another. And <laughs> it's amazing to me because even though they talk a lot about poverty and these poor people, I kind of have a PhD in poverty. I mean, I, I was born where sometimes we had to boil grass in order to survive. So I know the poverty status. I know the, the people that are poor, the way we behave, we're very no noble, we're very laid back, we're very appreciative of anything because we have nothing. So if they even give us a glass of water, we're thankful for the glass of water. And when I see these people, I have yet seen a person, one person that I say, that's a poor person. I've seen lots of middle class and mainly young, spoiled people that are coming here. Mainly, I, I have not seen any poverty. When I see all these thousands of people coming across, they are not appreciative of what they get. They, they don't appreciate being given food and water. Oftentimes they, they turn their backs and throw the food away. Poor people don't do that. So that, that's, to me, that's, that, that, that doesn't factor in because these are not poor people coming in. Which, what kind of plant is that? Looks like it has a lot of <clears throat> butterflies on it. This uh, is one of the milkweeds that we have. This plant is pretty, it's pretty nice because uh, it's a nectarine plant. So the butterflies come and, come and get their nectar, the adult butterflies. But it also a host plant. So after they feed on the nectar, especially the queens and the monarchs, then they decide, oh, this is food for my baby. So they lay their eggs too. So this will get, will grow the, the, the caterpillars and it would feed the adults, which is not the case. Many plants are just uh, uh, host plants. They don't produce much nectar, but this is great because it does both. Is it easy to grow? It's very easy to grow. <clears throat> uh, it's very hardy. It doesn't require a lot of uh, maintenance. And uh, we, we sell quite a bit of it. Yeah. yeah, the seeds are dispersed by the wind. When the little seed pot opens, they're like miniature parachutes. They disperse and they fly like miniature parachutes and then they fall in a nice environment. And then <clears throat> a few months later, depending on the time of the year, they germinate and they have a second generation. So. Do you think this might be something good to seed along the uh, private border wall that they're building? Yeah, it would be an excellent plant. <clears throat> it, would, uh, it would seed itself. So once you get a little population started, <clears throat> you just keep coming in year after year after year. So it's excellent. So some, some creatures, I call them creatures of the night, fascinating. Uh, 
Some are attracted by light. So the lights along the border will not attract any more, any less than the lights on 83. And there are lots of lights in everywhere in town. But what I find really fascinating is when I, when I talk about creatures of the night, is the whole ecology involved now? But in an environment like this, man, I, it's a whole ecology. It attracts lots of beetles, lots of insects. Those insects attract uh, night creatures like the paracas and the night hawks and the bats. And then in the morning, as the light comes up, there's a bunch of beetles and spiders that are, they're not necessarily attracted by the light, but they're attracted by the creatures that are attracted by the light. So they come in, I call those the first shift. They come in and feed. They scavenge and whatever's left over at, at, at night. And then the second shift comes in. So then you get armadillos and skunks and possums that they come and feed on the beetles. And so it's a whole ecology that actually, it's like a whole life cycle that a lot of, a lot of those night creatures uh, a lot of frogs, the Bufa marinas, the big giant uh, Texas frog. And I, you know, we don't have hardly any lights here at the ranch. It's pretty, we're pretty far away from the light pollution in town. But we do have a security light. So this would be like security lights. We do have a security light at our gate. And in the mornings when I go there, I'm amazed by the number. And even uh, frogs and toads and snakes and possums and raccoons, lots of skunks armadillos because they're like the second shift so it's it's not uh bad for the environment and in in this in this type of uh situation i think it actually provides a lot of food for some of the creatures that normally wouldn't have the the food to survive in order to reproduce and and continue their life cycle